Ah, and we are live. Welcome back to Takes by Fans. We got a great show for you today. As always, we are live every single day at noon Eastern. If you want to watch live, head over to twitch.tv slash Takes by Fans. If you want to watch but not live, uh, head over to our YouTube channel, Takes by Fans. We post all of our shows and clips of the show there on a daily basis. And if you just want to listen, we are on podcasting apps, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio. So, However you want to watch or listen, we've got you covered multiple ways. Alrighty, folks, today is a big old Saturday game five of a tied 2-2 NBA Finals on uh, tonight. Thank goodness, folks, we made it. No basketball on Thursday, no basketball on Friday, but we made it, folks. The promised land, Saturday. So we're going to be breaking down the game tonight. Trying to get our moneymaker back on track. We are 0 for 4, batting 0 for 4 in the finals on our spreads. We The closest we got was last uh, last game, game 4, when we took the Suns plus 5 and they lose by 6. So we'll see what the spread is, talk it through, and determine our kind of winner for tonight's game. And you see that we have brought back our Chris Paul jersey, CP3 from the Clippers, folks. Um... We kind of control the finals a little bit, folks. We kind of control the outcome of the finals. Because in games one and two, we wore this Chris Paul jersey live on the show. What happened? The Suns won game one and two. Then we didn't wear it, uh, the Chris Paul jersey, for the games three and four with the Bucks at home. And the Bucks won both of those games. So I left it up to y'all. <laughs> I left it up to y'all in a poll. Of should we wear the Chris Paul jersey today because that's basically going to mean that the Suns going to win or don't we wear it which means that the Bucks will win tonight and the people have spoken in a full vote of four to one we bring out the Chris Paul jersey for tonight's game five tipping off at nine Eastern tonight so the Suns will win tonight but do we like the spread? Are the Bucks getting a couple of points that we think we like? If they're getting like six points, folks, we may take that value. We may take that value. Chris Middleton finally steps up on the road. We'll see. So we've got that today on the show. And we also have a little bit of a special highlight. A player in the NFL just retired yesterday. So we're going to kind of celebrate him a little bit today on the show as well. So let's just jump right into it with the stories of the day. And the first one up is classic. Our kind of daily watch of Richard Sherman, folks. What is the newest update on this man? Well, he had a hearing yesterday um, about, uh, I think it was going on about like noon-ish. And uh, we finally have the results from that. And we hear from Richard Sherman himself. So let's start off here by Richard Sherman's apology. I believe he said this in court, and then he kind of tweeted out the same thing. So this is what Richard Sherman said. Here we go. Quote, I am deeply remorseful for my actions on Tuesday night. I behaved in a manner I am not proud of. I have been dealing with some personal challenges over the last several months, but that is not an excuse for how I acted. The importance of mental and emotional health is extremely real, and I vow to get the help I need. I appreciate all the people who have reached out in support of me and my family, including our community here in Seattle. I am grateful to have such an amazing wife, family, and support system to lean on during this time. Alrighty, I mean, that's exactly what you needed to say. Took responsibility, um, you know, kind of threw out some, you know, decently beloved um, ideas out there, mental, emotional health, which, you know, obviously everybody goes through, but, you know, you say that and you instantly get brownie points by everybody else. And we're not kind of, we're just talking out all the information here, folks. We're not on Richard Sherman's side or not on his side. We're just speaking out the information here. But, um, you know, has the apology. You have to have an apology after that, after your big story, after kind of your actions are caught on camera of you trying to break down the door and everything like that. And then you go and appear in front of a judge. You obviously have to have an apology. Does Richard Sherman mean all this? Yeah, I'm sure he does. Um, but it's kind of classic boilerplate apology. I mean, when we look at every apology that has ever been really issued, um, they all kind of look the same. And that's not knocking any apology. You have to apologize. I mean, that's just kind of the nature of the thing. Like, wow, I never, I, you know, I wouldn't have done that if I was drunk. I wouldn't have done this, you know, if I wasn't under, you know, extreme mental and emotional stress and all that. So, you know, I 
I issue this apology. Um, that was not me out there. This was, you know, like his wife said, kind of an out of the ordinary act for him. So he's deeply remorseful, kind of, um, you know, puts it, you know, hey, you know, I'm going through a lot of things right now, but that's not an excuse. Once again, you know, really kind of what you have to say in the situation. So for Richard Sherman, and the like when I judge apologies, um, whether they're real or fake or, you know, if they mean anything or not, the, the only thing that matters in an apology is the people that you are apologizing to. We were not affected by this. So I don't get to judge the apology as, you know, oh, OK, you know, I don't need to accept the apology. The community, the officers, the wife, if they all accept the apology, the, this the apology by Richard Sherman, then we can all move on. Then the act is, you know, water under the bridge and we can move on and everybody learns and everybody grows from it. But, you know, somebody on Twitter who's like, you know what, you know, who's not even there, you know, he's like, I don't accept this Richard Sherman apology. We don't care. <laughs> Nobody cares. The apologies are only for the people affected by the person doing the apologizing. Everybody else can go fuck themselves, can fuck off. It doesn't mean anything to y'all. So Richard Sherman, like we know, is big in the community there. He's kind of beloved. He's a vocal kind of uh, activist for kind of mental and emotional health and all that. So, you know, I'm sure they will, you know, accept his apology. The police will probably accept his apology of, you know, resisting a little bit, even though he's not admitting to that because he just pleaded not guilty in court. But, you know, he's off offering his kind of, um, you know, he says, um, I appreciate all the people who have reached out in support of me and my family, including our community here in Seattle. So, you know, part of the community, you know, loving Richard Sherman. So if they all say, hey, this apology is good, we're good to go, we accept it, all that, then we're fine. We don't have to kind of bring this up. This is out of the ordinary for Richard Sherman, and hopefully we never see this side of Richard Sherman again because I would not want to be on the other side of angry, drunk Richard Sherman because that's – we, we just saw that. That's a little, little scary, a little scary trying to b break down your door. So that was the apology by Richard Sherman. Now, he also appeared in court yesterday as well. So let's see what was going on at that hearing. We know he was charged with uh, four or five uh, misdemeanor charges. So let's see. Did he plead guilty, not guilty, and what happened at that court hearing? So here we go. Free agent cornerback Richard Sherman, who earlier Friday said he was, quote, deeply remorseful for his actions, had pleaded not guilty to five misdemeanor charges stemming from his arrest at his in-law's home northeast of Seattle earlier this week and yeah of course you're gonna plead not guilty I advise everybody to plead not guilty even if they got you on camera even if they got you admitting it even if they kind of like they're like we know you did this you're right there you're right there it's like shaggy no it wasn't me hey you caught me on the counter <laughs> wasn't me we even got you on camera wasn't me. Always defend yourself. Always defend yourself. Always not guilty. So I've got no problem with Richard Sherman saying not guilty here, even though there are some things that potentially do kind of have damning evidence. They have his blood. Um, so for that DUI charge, we have him trying to break down the door on that kind of ring doorbell camera. But hey, still say not guilty. I've got no problem with it. All right. According to documents filed by the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office on Friday, the charges include two domestic violence counts, criminal trespass in the second degree, and malicious mischief in the third degree, along with resisting arrest, driving while under the influence, and reckless endangerment of roadway workers. Because we know he crashed his car um, in a construction zone. Unfortunate. So those were all the five charges that he's being charged with. Uh, the charges are all misdemeanors punishable by up to 90 days in jails, in jail or gross misdemeanors punishable by up to one year. So ooh, that's never great. 90 to a year he's potentially looking out for. And we know he's not on a team and training camp starts in about a week and a half. So 90 days in jail is more than a week and a half. One year in jail is more than a week and a half. So that would not be great for Richard Sherman playing this year. Now they probably won't be kind of going for the kind of, 
the choke, the maximum one year, just because they let this man go without bail, released on your own recognizance, so you don't need to kind of front up any money. They're like, yeah, we we know you're going to show up. Richard Sherman cannot not show up to this hearing. Uh, first of all, they're all misdemeanors, so, you know, it's not like anything that big. Yes, you may be facing jail time. But, you know, you're a pillar pillar in your community. That's the one thing that the judge said while he was kind of determining the bail factor. So it doesn't seem like they're going to go hard on Richard Sherman. You skip the court date. You skip your hearing dates. You sc you're skipping all that. Then, yes, they're going to put you away. So it seems like Richard Sherman's going to show up to these court dates, court dates, and then they'll probably just give him maybe time served, maybe some community service, which he would love to do. <laughs> He'd be like, oh, you're going to sentence me to community service? Well, I've been doing this, so I'm, I'm basically already good. I got backlogged, you know, hours and hours and hours on end. But, yeah, I'll take a couple more hours here of community service. No big deal. <laughs> you know, I had I had a, uh, you know, food drive planned for next week. I can just count for the, count that for some of my hours over there. All right, what else do we get here? What else do we get here? Here we go. Sherman appeared with his wife. Love that. That's definitely good when having a domestic violence dispute. You know, you and your family that, you know, all coming together in support of you and you know Ashley Sherman has been there right by his side ever since this kind of news broke she was always there defending Richard Sherman so always great there so Sherman appeared with his wife Ashley Sherman at his arraignment before King County District Judge Lisa Paglisati Paglisati on Friday in Seattle his next scheduled court date is pre-trial hearing on August 13th Ooh, that's not the greatest Richard Sherman would like this to kind of be swept under the rug as quickly as possible we like we said you know he's in uh, he's a free agent here no team has signed him we've got training camp coming up at the 28th that's when kind of every team start date start at the 28th uh, a couple of teams start a little bit earlier because they're in the Hall of Fame game but the 28th is really when everybody is there for training camp so you know August 13th that's about you know two weeks after the start of training camp maybe even three weeks after the start of training camp so when teams are like yeah what are we doing with Richard Sherman should we bring him in for a tryout should we bring him on our team it's like well he still has this court thing going on and we don't know how that's going to play out so let's wait so that's not great for Richard Sherman who definitely still wants to play in the NFL. I don't think this man wants to stop playing in the NFL. It's just unfortunately no teams have really reached out to him thus far. And this kind of incident is definitely going to make it a little bit even more hard. A little bit of a more kind of, you know, gorilla in the room, monkey on your back. That, you know, he's not going to be playing this season. So not the greatest there. Conditions of Sherman's release include avoiding any contact with his father-in-law, Raymond Moss. Who he tried to break down the door. On Friday afternoon, Sherman posted a statement to Twitter acknowledging the week's events, which we just read, so we're not going to read it again. Sherman was arrested Wednesday after police said he crashed his car in a construction zone along a busy highway east of Seattle and then tried to break into in-laws' home in the suburb of Redmond, Washington. Moss told officers that he armed himself with a handgun and fired pepper spray as Sherman tried to bust in the door with the shoulder that we saw. All right, uh, let's we can just finish off the article here a little bit kind of more in-depth analysis of what actually happened that night because we still don't know what the entire ordeal was about. So officers were cautious about arresting Sherman because of his size, strength and belligerence, according to police reports released Thursday. Sherman displayed, quote, severe mood swings in slurred speech, had bloodshot, watery eyes and had the odor of intoxicants emitting from his person. During contact with authorities, according to reports, Sherman told authorities that there that Sherman told authorities there that he was upset over his children being taken from him. All right. So now we understand, you know, he had his children taken away from him. He wanted to see him. And, you know, that's just classic domestic disputes. That's I would probably is. I don't I don't know. I mean, I don't have an official number, but I would say that's kind of the majority of domestic disputes. You, you know, one party keeping the other party from seeing their children. People want to see their children. People should sh see their children. It's unfortunate the circumstances like that and that, you know, it does reach to this level at some point. 
All right, after he allegedly resisted arrest, Sherman's mood seemed to lighten once he was in custody, and he even joked about the form the trooper had used to take him to the ground, according to the police reports. Sherman was, quote, polite and cooperative at the hospital where he was taken to be treated for a police dog bite he suffered during the altercation with authorities. So, you know, we know he resisted arrest, and they had to release the hound on him, and they got him on the, uh, I believe, the calf, they were kind of saying. Sherman was released without bail after a hearing Thursday. As terms of his release, Sherman was ordered to not have contact with his father-in-law, not to use alcohol or non-prescription drugs, and not to possess a weapon. In February, King County prosecutors and the sheriff obtained an, quote, extreme risk protection order for Sherman, which barred him from having guns after a judge determined he posed a danger to himself or others. Details of that case were sealed, and it was not immediately clear whether any weapons had been seized from him. So that's not great. He's kind of had a little bit of a history with this last February, and now we're getting this, uh, you know, five months later as well. So hopefully, you know, Sherman's not going on a kind of downward spiral. We're really hoping this has nothing to do, nothing, absolutely zero to do with CTE. We really, really hope so. Uh, you know, when you're in the league for, you know, about 10 years and you're at the highest of your game, you know, we know football is a dangerous contact sport, folks. You know, we say this time and time again. The NFL will do whatever it takes, spend as much money as they need to, to make sure that no real research and no real studies come out from CTE. That is That, was, that would be the one thing that truly just hurts the NFL and really could potentially just ruin the overall business. And we know that businesses don't like to lose money. And if you shut down a business, they lose money. So we're hoping that it has nothing to do with it. But we have kind of two incidents here one that we were able to see and then the other one last February where we really don't know what happened because it was sealed so we'll keep an eye on Richard Sherman obviously we'll see if he can kind of get on a team here at some point it doesn't look like it's going to be the greatest or easiest time for this man to rejoin an NFL team especially you know with training camp in this hearing all kind of being done at the same time but I don't think this man's really going to be facing that much jail time I really don't I think they'll just kind of you know all right you're charged with all these misdemeanors and that's really it that's really it don't do it again. Obviously, you know, this is kind of your first big offense here um, that has made all the headlines. So kind of give, you know, a, the one time free pass. So we'll see what happens with Richard Sherman. The next court date is August 13th. So we have a little bit more time to, uh, you know, sleep on the information, to digest the information and see what else has happened if anything else comes up. All right, let's keep moving on here, and um, this is just something. Do we read too much into this? Should we read too much into this? Is it responsible for us to read this much into it? Well, let's see what we're talking about. So here we go. Raiders running back coach Kirby Wilson is retiring from the NFL. All righty. So we've been hearing, you know, from the Raiders this entire offseason, especially Kenyon Drake, who's like, yeah, this Raiders running back room is about to be fantastic. We love Josh Jacobs. And then we also are real big kind of believers in Kenyon Drake to get it done. Kenyon Drake, 900 yards last season. Josh Jacobs, 1,000 plus yards last season. So with this running back coach who's been in the league for 20 plus years is now all of a sudden deciding to retire. Does that kind of point to that this Raiders team isn't going to be that great? Because who retires when you're on the verge of a potential Super Bowl? I mean, this Raiders offense has all the talented pieces necessary to win a ring. The defense is a little all right, but the running back coach doesn't go one more year to see what they can do. You just brought in Kenyon Drake, another real solid running back in this league, and now you call it quits? Should we read too much into this, folks? Should we read into this that, hey, this Raiders offense isn't going to be that good? Or, you know, John Gruden is truly not that great of a, uh, of a head coach because the running back coach doesn't want to stay one more year? The heck is that? So just kind of curious on the timing. This Raiders running game is supposed to be A1 tier 1 this year. Josh Jacobs, Kenyon Drake. But this beloved... Running backs coach just retired. What do we make of that? 
So we can just kind of go over this quickly here. Kirby Wilson has spent the vast majority of the last quarter century coaching in the NFL. His time in the pro game has reached its conclusion. The Raiders running back coach is retiring from coaching. Wilson has been considered one of the sport's most respected assistants for much of his career, no matter where he's been, beginning his NFL, beginning his time in the NFL with the New England Patriots in 19... 19- 97 in spending stints in Washington, Tampa Bay, Arizona, Minnesota, Cleveland, in both Oakland and Las Vegas with the Raiders. Over that span, Wilson coached four running backs who finished up the top 15 in career rushing yards. Emmett Smith, Adrian P- Peterson, Curtis Martin, Edrin James, folks. And now he's retiring? Why? This is supposed to be the year for the Raiders. Real interesting here, folks. Two of those running backs ended up in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Smith and Martin, while the third is headed to Canton in August. James in a fourth will one day be finding himself receiving his own bronze bust in a gold jacket. His most recent product, Josh Jacobs, has rushed for 1,000 yard plus yards in each of his first two Pro seasons, completing both under the watchful eye of Wilson. The former Illinois standout running back and receiver heads off into retirement with a fantastic coaching career behind him. He won't be forgotten by those remaining in the NFL anytime soon. So this beloved coach, beloved by everybody, has been kind of coaching some of the all-time greats in this league. And now you bring in Kenyon Drake to just kind of beef up this running back room a little bit more. But now you decide to retire? I don't know, man. He was born in 1961. How old is that? 39 plus 20. 59? He's retiring at 59? That's not that old, folks. That's not that old. A lot of coaches are older than 59. I think Bruce Arians is older than 59. I think Bill Belichick is older than 59. Sean Payton is older than 59, I believe. And this man... Little old 59 over here. I don't know, man. Birthday coming up, August 24th, turning 60. He's got a career record of 178 and 190. Uh, It's a losing record. Not the greatest there. 48% win percentage. But his playoff win percentage is 60%. 9-6 in the playoffs. That's real solid. I'll give him that. Just a running back coach for his entire career, folks. Like they said, starting in 1997 with the the, uh, Patriots. Then he went to the Bucks, 2002, 2003. Is this when they won a ring? Oh, he's got a couple of rings? 2008 Steelers, is that a ring winning team? Let me get this up. I think this man's got a couple of Super Bowls under his belt too. Look at that. Let's double check. I think he's won two rings. I think this man has won two rings, folks. All right, the 2008. All right, let's start here. 2002 Tampa Bay Bucks. That was John Gruden, I believe. Here it is. Bingo, bango. The Bucks. He's got a ring with the Bucks. Reuniting with John Gruden. Love it. And then the 2008 Pittsburgh Steelers. Is that correct? Yes, sir. The man's got two rings. And then he was with the Steelers in 2010 when they went back. Unfortunately, they lose against the Packers. That's Aaron Rodgers' one and only win there in the Super Bowl. But the man's got two rings. Coaching legacies. Coaching absolute of the greatest running backs of all time. And now he calls the quits? When you bring in Kenyon Drake and Josh Jacobs going into his third year, this is supposed to be it for the Raiders, folks. This is supposed to be their year, their big breakout season. But he retires now. I don't like it. Do we read that much into it, folks? Should we be reading into it that deep? Or is he just like, you know what? Yeah, I don't care no more. I'm out. (laughs) I don't care. Win the ring without me. I don't care. I've got two. Why do I need another one? I don't. (laughs) Goodbye. Goodbye. I've got two. (laughs) I'm just retiring, so... Alrighty, 
Just a little interesting, folks. A little nugget, a little kind of drop of information that we could potentially use and come back to if the Raiders just flounder overall this season. Maybe Kirby is seeing the writing on the wall being like, yeah, this man truly, John Gruden, can truly not coach this team. I'm not sticking around for another disaster year. I'm out of here. He's not ruining my legacy. I already have a not great win percentage, <laughs> you know, 48%. I need to get that up. And I'm not going to get be getting that up here with the Raiders because John Gruden is really ruining this team, just not being good. So we'll see, man. One of the greatest running back coaches, one of the most respected running back coaches for 20 years in this league has retiring when he has two real great solid running backs on his team. I don't know, folks. I don't know about it. Something doesn't just sit right with me, folks. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Let's keep moving on here. And the Packers president, Mark Murphy, says there is still no update on Aaron Rodgers' status. Like we know, we just heard from Aaron Rodgers what was going to go on. He was going to enjoy that golfing uh, tournament, and then he was going to take a couple weeks and decide – um, what his plan is. So, you know, Mark Murphy, the president for the Packers, has no inside information. We know that Aaron Rodgers doesn't talk to anybody on anything that he is planning or not planning to do. So we get this short article right here. Let's just see if there's any good information on here and what the quote is. So here we go. We're just weeks away from training camp, and there's still no update on Aaron Rodgers' situation in Green Bay. There is an update. It's just Aaron Rodgers has said that, hey, I, I'm taking two weeks to decide, a couple of weeks. He said this when it was two weeks before the start of the Green Bay Packers training camp that he was going to take a couple of weeks to kind of figure out his circumstances, figure out the situation. So, of course, that didn't stop a Zoom participant from asking. Packer President Mark Murphy was asked Friday during a session regarding the business side of the club whether he could provide any new information on the matter. Not to spoil the surprise, but there wasn't. Quote, this is really limited to question this is really li limited to questions regarding financial statements i would just say there's nothing new to update on the issue that you raised business as usual at least since late april with both sides dug in and camp around the corner we can prepare for one of two realities a welcomed resolution and return of rogers to green bay or a future centered around jordan love we do not believe whatever happens here that um that um, the Packers will be trading Aaron Rodgers. They're not going to kind of, you know, be like, uh, you know, giving Aaron Rodgers what they want because it makes no sense. Like Aaron Rodgers not wanting to be part of this Green Bay team, uh, you know, it's seeming to do with all respect. But what what are the what are the evidence of him being disrespected? Because we really don't think there's really any big disrespected, like any any examples that are truly big time disrespect. Drafting Jordan Love, okay, we're drafting your potential replacement. They were always like, yeah, you're not going to you're going to be the guy here as long as you want. We're just having Jordan Love just in case in securing him up because we're gonna have to have somebody after you. We did the same thing with Brett Favre. You sat for three years behind Brett Favre. That's just how it goes. If Jordan Love doesn't pan out, oh, well, we can maybe draft one next year. But we're going to start this process a little early here. So I've got no problem with the Packers drafting Jordan Love. Um, not drafting any kind of offensive pieces. They've gone defensive heavy in the draft the Packers had the last two seasons. The only offensive player was drafting Jordan Love. But, folks, we talk about, you know, the Packers' weapons all the time. Aaron Jones, Devontae Adams, who is highly regarded as the number one wide receiver in the NFL by the coaches and the players and the scouts. We just saw that earlier this week in the show, folks. And then you got Robert and Tanyan as a tight end. So it's like, how much more help do you actually need? There's a, a, no, a whole nother side of the football, folks, the defensive side. So Aaron Rodgers doesn't play defense. Aaron Rodgers plays offense. And then the fact that, you know, Aaron Rodgers upset that they didn't go for it on fourth down. Well, you know, the defense forced three turnovers on Tom Brady. So I would kind of trust my defense a little bit too since you weren't really capitalizing that much on opportunities offensively in that NFC Championship game at home when once again we went 13-3. and three. So I'm not blaming Matt LaFleur all over the place. What would have happened if Aaron Rodgers went for it on fourth down and had an incompletion? Then we're all kind of banging on Aaron Rodgers. 
So this could be, you know, I just think it's a little nonsense that Aaron Rodgers is going kind of this above and beyond to kind of get out of here in Green Bay. I don't agree with it. Obviously, I don't know all the information. I'm not there in the organization and in the locker room feeling what Aaron Rodgers is feeling. But from all the kind of crumbs that he's dropping about what is truly wrong about this Packers team and organization, I kind of don't agree 100% on all of it. So we'll know more in the next couple of weeks here, the next week and a half, till the 28th when training camp gets going. Does Aaron Rodgers show up day one of training camp? Does he make the Packers sweat a little bit, maybe show up two weeks later? Or does he just not play at all? Big possibility there as well. So he didn't decide to opt out of this season, which kind of tells us he is going to be back. We do think that Aaron Rodgers is going to play for the Packers this year. One, if he doesn't play, it affects his legacy big, big, big time. And he didn't opt out of the season. He could have easily opted out because of the COVID situation, folks. They were offering you uh, players to opt out of this season because of COVID. No players has has opted out this year. We saw a lot of players opt out last season. Nobody opt out this year. So we truly think Aaron Rodgers is going to play. Um, it's just whether he's going to show up day one, week one for the training camp, or he makes the Green Bay Packers sweat a little bit. Those are really the only two options that we really see happening. I don't think Aaron Rodgers just straight up does not play. And you may be wondering, well, who asked that question? Well, it was little old Adam Schefter himself. So he said he asked Friday during a call on the team's finances whether Rodgers would report to camp. President Mark Murphy answered, quote, I appreciate the question. This is really limited to questions regarding financial statements. I would just say there's nothing new to update on this issue. So exactly what we just read in that article, Adam Schefter comes out and says, yeah, that was basically me. So Adam Schefter always trying to get down to the nitty gritty, always trying to get the dirt will kind of uh, zoom bomb a financial call to ask about Aaron Rodgers. This man has no chill. This man has no sleep mode. He is all business 24 seven. And I guess we respect it a little bit. So that was it. Uh, they didn't name him in the article, but Adam Schefter names him, him <laughs> names himself himself earlier today that it was actually him. Alrighty, last thing to talk about, baby. Oh, man, I'm definitely upset to see this man leave in the NFL. One of my favorite players of all time. Obviously, he's not an A1, Tier 1 superstar, but he's my favorite kind of non-superstar player in this league. I love his burst of speed. His return to game was absolutely magnificent. And, uh... He's unfortunately retiring from the NFL. We know he didn't have a home, and uh, we didn't really want to see him retire, but he did officially just announce his retirement. So veteran wide receiver Ted Ginn Jr. announces his retirement after 14 NFL years across a couple of teams, the Dolphins, starting with the Dolphins. And, uh, folks, I'm a big fan of him, folks. Big, big fan. This is probably the best card sports card i have a ted ginn jr jersey card absolutely fantastic like i said probably the best card i have maybe i got a uh, ricky williams autographed jersey card from the dolphins too but absolutely appreciate ted ginn for all his service here even though you know he wasn't the greatest wide receiver like i said you know we know this man's not a one tier one but he's just a great talent i think just overall for the game uh so started three years with the dolphins this man only has 33 career touchdowns which obviously isn't great for a wide receiver especially over 14 years but he got it done in the return game and he was able to get to the super bowl a couple a couple of times so love seeing that and that's kind of what we're going to focus on here we're going to kind of celebrate ted Ginn a little bit here uh today we got every single one of his touches in his two Super Bowls, folks. He was with the uh, the 49ers during the 2012 Super Bowl of the 49ers versus the Ravens. Didn't get a lot of burn there, but then he came back in 2015 with the Panthers for the uh, Super Bowl 50 of Broncos versus Panthers, and he got a lot more burn there. So we're going to look at every single possession of Ted Ginn in all the Super Bowls. But first, let's go into this article right here. Do they have his official uh, retirement quote or something? I believe they do in here. So let's just kind of get a nice little overview of our boy here, Ted Ginn Jr. So here we go. Ted Ginn once sprinted to a Division I scholarship in a first-round selection in the NFL draft. Now he's coasting into retirement, and he's going to be a sure fa sure 
surefire first ballot Hall of Famer. You better believe. You better believe it. Uh, the 14 year veteran is hanging up his cleats. Ginn announced his retirement on Friday's edition of NFL Total Access on NFL Network. Quote, sad to say, but not really sad to say, really joyful to say that I'm going to take my time and retire this year. I had a great career, little league to NFL. I have nothing to hold back. I enjoyed my time at every level. I, I played at the highest level. I'm just thankful to be able to have this time, and it's a joy. So... Ted Ginn, classy as always, not uh, regretful on anything that he did, has played at the highest level, has been to the Super Bowl, would have loved to see him win one ring. Unfortunately, he didn't, but, you know, still an overall great journey in the NFL. A natural athlete with elite speed. Elite speed, baby. I mean, he is kind of, you know, Devin Hester was good on kick returns. Uh, Ted Ginn is basically the Devin Hester of punt returns. I will say that. I do not care. I love it, folks. Truly natural elite speed. Ginn was a two-sport star at Cleveland's Glenville High School, playing quarterback, wide receiver, and defensive back for the Tarblooders. Tar Blooders? Jeez. <laughs> the heck name is that? Uh, Tar Blooders football team, which was coached by his father, Rever uh, revered community figure Ted Good Sr., and winning a national title in the 110 meter hurdles as part of Glenville's track and field team. Ginn's football exploits earned him All American status in a trip to the U.S. Army All American Bowl before signing to play football at Ohio State. Ginn, 36, starred as a receiver and a returner with the Buckeyes, becoming a three time All American and garnering All Big Ten first team honors in 2006. His game breaking speed was enough for the Dolphins to spend the ninth overall pick on him in the 2007 NFL Draft. Ginn's receiving career never reached the expectations placed upon him. Truly unfortunate that. I mean, we could have been talking about, you know, Tyreek Hill before Tyreek Hill, honestly. Uh, that's how great Ted Ginn is. That's how great his speed was. He's also only 5'11". All right, so Ginn's receiving career never reached the expectations placed upon him by first-round selection but he proved to be a quality secondary option in the passing game, finishing with 5,742 career receiving yards and 33 touchdowns. And that's what we mean. We know this man isn't a Megatron, a DK Metcalf, anything of that sort of Devontae Adams and Stephon Diggs, but he's a solid second or third tier option out there. And that's why we, you know, enjoyed him. You know, not everybody's, you know, A1 tier one in this league, folks. Obviously not. The like 1% are A1 tier one. So, you know, we can still respect and there's still great tier two players out here um, all over the plays and Ted Ginn I believe was definitely one of those he was occasionally devastating in the return game scoring seven total return touchdowns four punt scores and three kick returns in his 14 years but failed to make a pro bowl in his in his time in the NFL truly unfortunate they should be ashamed of themselves the pro bowl voting committee should all be ashamed of themselves Ginn bounced around the league, moving from Miami to San Francisco in 2010, where he was more efficient in the return game than as a traditional receiver. Ginn found new life as a receiver in Carolina, where he played for the Panthers in 2013 and 2015-16. Ginn appeared in Super Bowl 50 in the 2015 season, showing a brief glimpse of the big play ability that defined his Ohio State career with the 45-yard reception that Ginn capped off by ducking out of bounds early in the third quarter of Carolina's eventual 2014. 10 loss to the Denver Broncos. We're going to watch that play and we're going to watch a whole lot of other plays, folks. I think we got like 15 plays of all just Super Bowl action queued up. Ginn finished with four receptions for, 40, for 74 yards in uh, the defeat. Ginn's best year as a pro receiver came in Carolina where he caught 134 passes for 2,047 yards and 19 touchdowns over three seasons he spent with the Panthers. That production brought him a few more year, years in the NFL with the Saints where he caught 100 passes for 1,400 yards and eight scores from 2017 to 2019. Ginn finished his time in the NFL with six games with the Chicago Bears in 2020 before calling it a career this week. He heads off into retirement with nearly a decade and a half of NFL experience a conference title, and two Super Bowl appearances to his name. Quote here by Ted Ginn. I enjoyed everything that I'd done, so I have no regrets. It was a joy. It was time. It was needed. I left a mark, and that's all you can really do. My dad always told me to leave my name on something. I left my name on something, and this man has truly left 
his name on my heart, folks. Ted Ginn, I don't have many cards. I'm not a big card collector, but Ted Ginn, I respect him a lot enough. He's one of my favorite players to talk about, one of my favorite players to watch. And for that, I thank you, and uh, hopefully the entire NFL thanks you as well. And because you held such a special place in our hearts here, we're about to celebrate the hell out of this man. We're about to celebrate the crap out of this man. So, we're not going to really kind of talk about his stats because, like I said, you know, I don't like to disrespect the man, but, you know, overall they were a little underwhelming. Just a tad underwhelming, but we still appreciate and loved everything he did. So, we're not going to really kind of focus on his stats. The first thing we are going to kind of take a quick little look at is what this man could mother-loving do, folks. This man, 2009, with the Miami Dolphins, had two 100-yard kick returns for touchdowns, baby, in the same mother-loving game. So let's start off this kind of retirement party with the big old bang, and let's see this man go to work. So here we go, week 8, 2009. Dolphins down 3-6 to six in the third quarter, and Ted Ginn, all the space hitting the right sideline, and that speed is gone. Look at these people trying to dive after this man. Look at that man. This, this defender had a great angle on it. It's just Ted Ginn is too quick. Missed there, and then the last defender trying to make it, and then for the last 40 yards, it is nowhere near him. Nobody will ever touch this man. Ted Ginn is arriving in the NFL baby you better believe it but he had something else up his sleeve as well in this game folks look at those old dolphin uniforms you love to see him Ted Ginn, folks, just look at this one, folks. Just look at it. Look at the blocking up front and then hits it. Sees all the daylight on the right side of the field. Hits the sideline and he is gone, folks. This man is a D1 track star. You better respect the speed, folks. Look at that 100-yard kick return for a touchdown and then he went and did it again this time later in the third quarter Dolphins up now 17 to 13 and they're ready to put the exclamation point on this game here we go Ted Ginn kind of catching it from the same spot heads all the way to the left side of the field stumble bumbled kind of knocked dead in his tracks at the 15 yard line but he finds Spates and then he turns on the Jets folks look at this acceleration right here folks look at this acceleration here it comes he turns on the Jets and once again he hits the 50 and he is gone look at this angle this defender tries to take this man right here it seems to be a great angle but he's too slow Ted Ginn burning these men folks let's go is this his first year in the league 2009 I think it's his second Oh, his third, his last year with the Dolphins. But, man, oh, man, he was absolutely spectacular, folks. Absolutely fantastically well done. Two kick return yard, two 100-yard kick return touchdowns. RIP Tony Sperano, obviously. But, man, oh, man. Ted Mother Loving Ginn, you better respect the name. He's running all the way to Canton, baby. Get this man a bronze bust. Gotta see, gotta see this man in the Hall of Fame. Man, oh man, look at the speed. Look at the speed. Y'all know I'm big bout speed here on the show, folks. And that is some elite speed. Gosh dang. Did they end up winning that game? Hopefully they won that game. Let's quickly check that. Hopefully those weren't kind of all for nothing. We get week nine against the Jets. Week eight against the Jets. And they end up winning 30-25. to 25. So Ted Ginn putting up 14 points himself in a 30-25 to 25 win. Yes, sir. Ted Ginn, thank you for that win. This year, what did we go? We went 7-9. So Ted Ginn responsible kind of single-handedly for one win out of those seven wins. You love to see it. So that's his kind of max potential, folks. That is his max potential, what we just saw right there. Absolutely fantastic. So let's start kind of... Oh, well, we have these. Um, well, well, let's... Uh, if we get anything good here. These are his career highlights from 2015 to 2019. Let's see if we get anything good. And if there's anything in the Super Bowl, we will sp uh, skip those for now because we have them all queued up anyway. But here we go. Just wide open. Bango, bango. That's too easy. I see some elite speed here. Can we watch this man run down the field? There he is. Just look at that streak. Oh, yeah. 
Way too wide open. Nobody can ever catch up to this man. Here we go. What's this one? Cam Newton starting at his own 12. Ted Ginn going deep. Look at the speed. He still got it, baby. He still got it. Woo. Love it. Look at this. Right behind the defense, about 90 yards, 88 yards. And Ted Ginn is just outrunning everybody. Nobody can catch this man, folks. Do y'all not understand the speed? Y'all understand the speed now? Y'all understand the speed now? Come on, come on, come on. Jack Del Rio, unfortunate. Oh, we're going to get it right off the rip. We get the entire replay right here. Here he is, folks. Just watch this man. It's just a streak route. That's it. He's just going fast. Sheer speed. Cam Newton trusting it. Fantastic. Look at him. You can't even keep up with it. You can't even keep up with it. Ted Ginn even adjusting to the ball. Look at that. Has to come inside a lot. Has to come inside like five yards and catches it mid-stride. Run, run, run. Folks, he's finishing five yards ahead of the defender. Absolutely fantastic. The man's a track star. Here we go against the Saints. Going deep again. Look at him go. Wide open. This man is Tyreek Hill-esque speed, folks. Yes! Absolutely magnificent! And then he gives the ball to a kid. What a guy. What a guy. Let's see if we get the replay here. Let's see them burn him. Let's watch Ted Ginn single-handedly burn this entire defense. Inside. Gone. Gone. Right there. Gone. They made a mistake. <laughs> Y'all haven't put a linebacker on this man. What? Are you nuts? Linebackers ain't got good speed like that. Burned instantly. Stop it. Respect this man. Look how slow this man. This man. This defender is trying his all to get, to get near Ted Ginn. Here we go against the Bills. Do we get another deep bomb? Do we get another deep bomb? He had a 10 touchdown season. That was his best season catching the ball. And look at that. Oh, he's got great hands too, baby. Right on the sideline. Two feet in bounds. Yes, sir. Let's watch this replay. Hopefully we get a great angle right there. Bingo, bango. That's not Stephon Gilmore. I don't believe. And look at that just right on the sideline. Not going against the number one corner, but hey, he's still making it work. All right, here we go against the box. Another deep threat. Another deep threat. Bingo, bango. And then he's down all the way for the touchdown. What did they call the flag on? Because that kind of looked like offensive pass interference. <laughs> this one kind of looked like a push off on Ted Ginn. Uh, do, does it uphold? Let's see, what do they call Oh, they called it on the defense. Wow. Okay, okay. Let's see. Let's see if it was defensive. Here we go. Ted Ginn, a lot of contact. Mm, wow, look at Ted Ginn barely catching this ball. Look at him catch this. Woof, woof, woof. Two feet and bounce, tiptoes the sideline, and he's gone, baby. I don't know if I agree with the defensive pass interference. I thought that was all good kind of contact right there, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter. He fights through the contact. All right, here we go with the Saints now. Drew Brees going deep, and he's got that deep threat. Yes, sir, and the speed is too much. The speed is too much. The speed is too much, folks. Come on, man. I'm going to be missing this, y'all. Oh, man. No more of this, folks. How unfortunate. Jeez. Man. Look at the speed, the strength to stay on his feet. The speed, uh, just, I mean, this man's running full speed the entire time. Ted Ginn kind of slowing down right here, and he's still able to get that burst of speed to finish off the last 20, 25 yards easy for the touchdown. Man, 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 man. Here we go. Drew Brees again going deep again, and Ted Ginn wide open again. Is that Desmond Trufant he's burning? Jeez, once again, folks, do y'all not understand it? Do y'all not understand it? Let's see, what year was this? This man's been in the league 10 years at this point. With the Saints, when did he play with the Saints? 2018 and 2019, folks. 2017, 2018, 2019. 
Man's been in the league for 10 years and still has the elite speed to get it done. Respect the man. Respect the man. Here we go against the Saints with the Saints again. Let's see, in the championship game, going deep, and he makes a big throw. He makes a big throw in the divisional championship games, baby. Is this the next play? The next play is the uh, the not pass interference call where the Rams go to the Super Bowl instead of the Saints. I believe that's it. But Ted getting, getting them all the way down inside the 15-yard line with under two minutes left. It's Ted Ginn, baby. Give him the respect. Here we go against the Bucks with the Saints and wide open. Wide open. Too fast. Can't cover the man. Ted Ginn, folks. Respect it. But, folks, we got good stuff right here. So, we've gone, we went and found every single play, whether it's an attempt, it's an incomplete toward his side, whether it's a punt return, kick return, catch completion, whatever it is, we found every single play in his two Super Bowl appearances. So, let's start watching what he was doing in the big games. So, the first one up here. Here we go. This is against uh, the Ravens in the Super Bowl with the 49ers 2012 season. Here we go. First play for Tengen going on a punt return. Let's see what he does here. 49ers down 15. Ted Ginn going to field the punt. Let's it bounce. Takes it off of one bounce. Can he escape? He hits the right side. The speed is still there. And then he gets it all the way down to the 30-yard line, folks. Ted Ginn coming up and setting this 49ers team into great field position to start the drive to try to mount this 15-point comeback that they decently mount but end up still losing. Look at Ted Ginn, folks. Goes all the way to the right, unfortunately. Could not outrun that last punter. Last-ditch effort by the punter. You give them credit. Knocks Ted Ginn out of bounds. All righty, great play there. Here we go, but still in the Super Bowl. Here we go. Now down eight, thankfully set up by the great punt return of Ted Ginn. Let's see what Ted Ginn does here as a receiver. Can Colin Kaepernick put it right on the money? Do we have a big explosive play? Here we go. I believe he's right here in the slot. Here we go. Colin Kaepernick fires it deep. Ah, oh, oh, that wasn't him in the slot. So let's rewind this. He's right here at the top of the screen. Goes deep and unfortunately tipped away by the defense. Colin Kaepernick couldn't get enough air under this. Let's see if we get another replay. Looks like they're going to have to settle for a field goal on this one. But here we go, Ted Ginn. Man, oh man. Unfortunate, just tipped away. That would have been a touchdown. That would have been Ted Ginn potentially tying up this game against the Ravens in the Super Bowl. Unfortunately, a little underthrown by... Colin Kaepernick. All right, here we go. The final four seconds. Kickoff here. 49ers down three points with four seconds left in the game. Can Ted Ginn take this to the house and win the game for the 49ers? Let's see what he does. A free kick here. Ted Ginn, here we go. Last play of the game. Ted Ginn up the middle. Beating three defenders and then unfortunately gets taken down. Ted Ginn couldn't clutch it up. That was tough. What 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 how how great would have that been? Ted Ginn just takes that in the last four seconds and returns it for a touchdown and wins the game single handedly. It would have loved to have seen it. That really would have cemented him in Canton if he did it. All right. Now we go to the Super Bowl 50, Broncos, Panthers, playing for the Panthers here. Now, he had, um, let's uh, check out the stats of this game overall because uh, Ted Ginn was the second leading receiver here 
for the Panthers in the Super Bowl. So this man was still kind of, you know, at the top of his game at 2015. Real solid there. Once again, seven, eight seasons in the league at this point. So Ted Ginn, four receptions for 74 yards on 10 targets. He was the mostly, he was the most targeted wide receiver for the Panthers. Now, we've got all of them queued up. So we'll see, are they bad throws by Cam Newton or truly unfortunate drops by Ted Ginn? I don't think so because the man never drops the ball. So they must all be on Cam Newton. But we'll see what we get here. He also has a couple of returns, uh, kick returns here as well so we can watch all those as well so let's start seeing what cam newton was looking like in or um ted ginn was looking like at super bowl 50 here we go here we go first play up <clears throat> Down three, nothing in the first quarter. Seven thirty-five left, and it's going to be a punt return. Let's see what can, uh, Ted Ginn Jr. can do with this. Here we go, fielding it at his own fifteen-yard line. He is going to field it, trying to hit the edge, and uh, unfortunately couldn't turn the burners on quick enough, and it goes for basically a no-yard gain on the return. All right, but he's just warming himself up, folks. It's the first quarter, no big deal, no big deal. Here we go, first passing play here. Ted Ginn over the middle of the field, and man, overthrow by Cam Newton. Damn it. Let's watch this one in the slow-mo because Ted Ginn, he would have maybe potentially taken this one to the house, folks, honestly. So here we go, Ted Ginn fighting inside. Cam Newton sees it, just puts a little bit too much on this. I mean, folks... You catch this one right here. You've got one safety to beat. You try to take him to the right sideline, and we know the speed on that right sideline, baby. That's some elite speed. Unfortunately, Cam Newton with the overthrow. Damn it. Damn it, Cam. You're ruining Ted Ginn's legacy. You can ruin your own legacy. That's fine, but don't be ruining other people's legacy. People don't respect Ted Ginn like that. He hits this one all the way for 70 yards for the touchdown. People respect him like that. Damn. All right, next play up here. Let's see what we get. All right, here we go. But, uh, Broncos punting from their own end zone. Still in the fourth, first quarter. Down 10 nothing here, Panthers are. All right, Ted Ginn fields it at his own 40-yard line. Little stutter, and he gets swallowed up. Nowhere to run. A little hesitant on kind of going with the run. There was also a flag that was going against the return team. So even if he did something, it would have been brought back. Why are people ruining this man's legacy? All right, all right, but he still has time to kind of get it done here. Now, the Panthers only down three now. Down 10-7. to seven. They're at midfield in the second quarter. Ted Ginn right here at the bottom of the screen. Here we go. Oh, and they're going to have Ted Ginn pass the ball, but he decides to run it and then loses four yards out of bounds. Unfortunate. Let's see what this passing play could have been. Was this going to be a fake pass, or was he actually going to run the entire time? So it looks like uh, the tight end over here is the only person going out for a route, and he was absolutely A1 tier 1 covered. Couldn't even throw back to Cam Newton either. He was covered very well, and the play is just breaking down. Once again, not really Ted Ginn's fault, just a decently bad play design that was nothing was open with so once again why do y'all keep ruining this man's legacy alrighty now we go to the second quarter still two minutes left Broncos punting from their own 25 yard line and the Panthers are down three let's see what Ted Ginn can do with this punt come on something big baby oh don't call for the fair catch dang it alrighty alrighty bad blocking Defender right at him. He has to fair catch it. Unfortunate. But let's keep going here. Here we go. Down six. 125 left in the second quarter. Ted Ginn at the top of the screen right here. Here we go. Cam Newton firing it. And once again, just really off the mark here. Ted Ginn decently covered. Cam Newton tries to fit it in, and it doesn't look like it's anywhere close. Let's kind of watch this one in the slow-mo, see if we can see anything. Cam Newton firing it, and once again, just a little bit too, too high on it. A little bit too high on the play. Incomplete pass. All righty. Come on. We got to see something here by Ted Ginn. We got to see something big. All right, here we go. Back in the third quarter now, still down six. Second and 10 at their own 20. Ted Ginn at the top of the screen. The only wide out here. Here we go. What does he do? 
Here we go. There we go. Ted Ginn open in the speed. The speed. Oh, yes, baby. I'm a little upset. He ran right out of bounds, not even challenging the defender. Speed. Speed. For about 30 plus yards. You love to see it. There we go. Ted Ginn with the big play. You love to see it, baby. Yes, sir. All right. Let's see if we can follow that play up. Still on the same drive here. We get second and nine, still down six by the Panthers. At the Broncos' 39-yard line, let's see what Ted Ginn can do here. Here we go, right slant, bingo, bingo, picks up the first. That's what we're talking about, baby. Oh, we get a celebration here by Ted Ginn. Yes, sir, first down in the Super Bowl. Talk your shit, baby. Let's see this one. Here we go. Winning at the line of scrimmage against Aqib Talib. Yes, sir. Going against an A1 tier one corner out here. And he's got that great separation. And look at that man go. Love it. All right, what's the next play up here by Ted Ginn? All right, here we go. A little bit later in the third quarter. Once again, Cam Newton is struggling to put up points on the board. They still only have seven. They are down nine points here. Once again, back at the Broncos 38-yard line. Ted get in motion all the way at the bottom of the screen here. Play action pass. Set up wide receiver screen that the blocking is absolutely trash on. He tries to reverse field. And he makes, look at that, three yards out of absolutely nothing. That would have been blown up for a couple of yard losses there. But Ted Ginn, with the sheer speed, is able to make something out of nothing and picks up three yards on the play. There we go. That's our man, Ted Ginn, baby. All right, here we go. Another play. Still down nine in the third quarter. They're at the Broncos' 28-yard line. Ted Ginn at the bottom of the screen. Top of the screen, I meant. And this one, uh, it gets picked off. He goes to, oh, oh, Ted Ginn. Oh, no. Ted Ginn had a chance to dive back on the loose fumble. Unfortunately, couldn't get there quick enough. But let's see this pass again. Was this a bad throw by Cam Newton? Or was this just an unfortunate drop here by Ted Ginn? So they're trying to hit him in the slant again. Let's see where Cam Newton places this ball. Ah, uh, a little slightly behind and off the fingertips of Ted Ginn. A tad, a tad behind. Not really at the body, at the hands. He threw it a little bit too high and outside. We can watch this one one more time in slow-mo. Now that we know what we're looking for, here he is coming in the slant. This ball going to hit him. Ugh, man, tough. Tough. Definitely could have been a little bit of a better throw. Got to put that one out in front, especially when you're throwing a slant. And then Ted Ginn's going to have the slight opportunity. Ball right here to go and make a play, jump right on it. Unfortunately, kind of get beefs out by the defender there. Ah, uh, Ted Ginn. Cam Newton not making it easy for you out there. Damn it. All right. Here we go. Now we're back, though. Can Ted Ginn do something good here? We're going to get a punt return. Uh, Broncos still up nine. Three minutes left in the third quarter. Cole quit punting from his own two-yard line. Let's see Ted Ginn. This should be fieldable. Come on, Teddy. Let's get a big one here, baby. A little stutter step. Hitting back to the outside. Stuttering again. Ugh. Just trying to do a little too much out there, Ted. Dang. And once again, another flag. What is this one on? Uh, legal blindside block on the receiving team. So once again, it would have all been for not even if he did something big. All right. Back on offense here, Ted Ginn. Let's see what we get here. Still down nine. Can Cam Newton, can you do something good here, please? Can you fire an accurate pass so Ted Ginn can take it to the house? We saw what he does when you put it right on the money. He potentially grows out, goes out for 30-plus yards. Here we go. Just a little comeback route for 10 yards. Picks up the first. We can respect it. All right. Back on the same drive here. Still down nine. First and 10. Let's see where they're at. All right, at their own 30-yard line, Ted Ginn at the top of the screen. 
And here we go. Cam Newton fighting out of the pocket. Cam Newton throwing it real low. Ted Ginn coming to dive for the ball, but they say it hit the ground. I don't know. I think Ted Ginn got his hands under this ball. Let's see this highlight. Let's see the replay. And once again, this is a bad throw by Cam Newton because it's real just short. Escapes the pressure of the pocket. Well done by Cam Newton throwing on the run. And this ball is wobbly. Way too low. And Ted Ginn couldn't get their hands low enough in time. So, I mean, Cam Newton's not making it easy for this man, folks. All right, another play up here. Still down nine. Panthers, can you do something? They're at the Broncos 21 yard line. This is the perfect opportunity to do something big. Let's see what happens. He goes to Cam Newton over the middle of the field and oh no. Could not hold on to the ball there. Ginn wants the flag. And they're going to have to settle for a field goal attempt. Unfortunate. Let's see this play one more time here. Let's slow it down. Just a simple kind of uh, comeback route. At the first down marker. Here we go. Cam Newton going to throw the ball. Defender all over him. Cam Newton throwing this one a tad behind. A tad behind. And it looks like Roby just rips out the ball. And doesn't allow Ted Ginn to make the catch. We'll get a great angle here. Here we go. Not too much behind, but a tad behind. You see him having kind of to twist his body back to it. Unfortunate. Should still have been caught. Poor here to kind of celebrate Ted Ginn. So it's a trash pass by Cam Newton. All right. We got uh, three more plays. Three more plays by Ted Ginn. Let's see if we get something good. Something great. That's what we want. Something great. All right. Another punt. And uh, the Panthers are only down six. One possession game now. Here we go. Ted Ginn punting or receiving the punt. And he has to take it out of bounds because the punter put it right on the sideline because he knows he's not giving Ted Ginn a chance. I mean, that's how you know they respect Ted Ginn in the return game. They punt right to the sideline. No chance at returning it. All right, now we get 34 seconds left, down 14. Big game over here. But let's see what Ted Ginn can do at the last couple of seconds. Cam Newton staying in the pocket and then throws it way too high once again for Ted Ginn. And then the very last play. That was the very last play. <laughs> so Ted Ginn in the Super Bowl does some real great things, unfortunately. Just doesn't have the other supporting cast. Ted Ginn was the best player on those Super Bowl teams, folks. I don't know what you, I don't know what y'all thought, uh, but it's all Ted Ginn. He single-handedly carried all those teams to the Super Bowl, and for that, we appreciate you, Ted Ginn. Going in your retirement, you definitely deserve it, and uh, we are definitely going to be missing you in the NFL. So that's it, folks. Ted Ginn, unfortunately, retiring from the NFL. Hate to see it. All right. Uh, let's end the show here. Let's uh, talk about Game 5 tonight. Suns, Bucks, back in Phoenix. Home teams winning every single game. So let's check out what the line is, and let's see what our official pick is going to be. We'll see all the ins and outs, and we will see what – we'll talk through it and see what we can get out of here. So here we go. Um, NBA Finals, why is that not on the front page? What the hack draft kings? You know the game is on tonight. We're talking about the finals, and it's not even on the front page. Here we go. All right. Here we go. Bucks, Suns. Bucks plus three and a half. Suns minus three and a half. Real light spread here. Unfortunate. We were hoping we'd get a little bit more points with this Bucks team. And unfortunately, we are not going to get a big old spread. All right. So here we go. The ins and outs. I'm assuming everybody's playing. Haven't heard anything today. So everybody's good to go for the Bucks, And everybody is good to go for the Suns. All righty. Now let's talk about this game. All right. Chris Paul. We have four games to talk about. And the home team has won every single game. So Chris Paul. He's only good at... At home, he's been turning the ball over a lot here. Even in game two, he even turned over the ball a lot. Um, the big figure floating around here is 15 turnovers over the last three games. That's not going to get it done. Chris Paul needs to calm down and be a more scoring threat in game number five here back at home, which he has been. 
Devin Booker has to once again kind of be a little solid out here. We need kind of 30 plus. He needs to command the ball and be the main focal point in the offense. DeAndre Ayton needs to get about 15 to 20 himself. He needs to kind of get it done in the paint. Now, the Bucks have kind of been locking up, locking him up down low. With, uh, you know, just Giannis down low and uh, P.J. Tucker using his big old beefiness to kind of just clog up the paint and uh, just be that beef, the size that they need to alter DeAndre Ayton. DeAndre Ayton must be a solid scoring player. Chris Paul and him need to get on the same page early. A lot of pick and rolls, a lot of potential lobs. Get DeAndre Ayton cooking. We need the scoreability from him. Jay Crowder, we need him to kind of just do what he does. Solid kind of three-point shooter out there. Make three to four threes. Put up about 10 to 12 points plus, And we'll have a solid night. Also, they need to lock it up down low defensively. Giannis has just been murdering this team whenever he wants. Uh, DeAndre Ayton and Jay Crowder cannot keep Giannis out of the paint. And then McCall Bridges. We need him to kind of be a little bit more aggressive shooting the ball as well. That was kind of what hurt this uh, Suns team on the road. That just nobody was having great success shooting the ball. Devin Booker had a great game four. Put up 40 plus points. Uh, but none of those points were from three. He was efficient as hack. 60%. That's absolutely fantastic. But then nobody else could really kind of step up and score the ball besides Devin Booker. And that's our biggest knock on this Suns team is that their scoreability sometimes just seems very, very lackluster. If DeAndre Ayton can't get it done in the paint, if, you know, Jay Crowder's missing from three, McCall Bridges sometimes only takes like four shots a game at the three, and then Chris Paul, like I said, he only averages 15 points a game, folks. It's not like this man's an A1 tier one scoring threat out there on the floor at any given time. He slows down the offense a little bit too much for our liking as well, just a tad bit, slows it down, waits out the entire shot clock most of the time. We need to see a more energetic, fast-paced Sun team that's why we like McCall Bridges or not McCall Bridges um, Cameron Payne that's why we like to give him a solid 20 to 25 minutes because the offense just hustles a little bit more when he's kind of the starting point guard instead of Chris Paul. So we'll see what happens here. We'll see how much, how many minutes kind of Monty Williams kind of plays Chris Paul. Chris Paul obviously deserves to have big time minutes. He should be able to be out there for the entire game if he wants. But I do think it hurts the team overall, um, Chris Paul being out there in long stretches, long minutes. Because, like we said, he doesn't really score the ball that well. Those two scoring outputs of Game 1 and Game 2. Let's get the official numbers up here. I want to say they were like 25 points plus. Both, game, both games 1 and 2. And those are outlier games. Not of just the regular season, but in the playoffs as well, folks. Uh, so here we go. The first two games against Milwaukee, he put up 32 points in 23 points. Just absolutely great scoring production. But that's nothing like we've seen. I mean, folks, these are his scoring totals for the entire playoffs. Here we go. We're just going to run right through them from game one all the way up to game 18, game four of the Bucks series. Here we go. 7 points, 6 points, 7 points, 18, 9, 8, 21, 17, 27, 37, 15, 18, 22, 41, 32, 23, 19, 10. So he is kind of, you know, all over the place, kind of, you know, figured out his scoring rhythm a little bit more in the kind of at the back end of the Western Conference Finals and the start of the NBA Finals, which is great, but we needed a little bit more reliable 10 points like he did in game number four is definitely not going to get it done, not even close, and we know that was a close six-point loss, and they were really kind of, you know, it was neck and neck. It was like a tie game with like two minutes left. So the fact that Chris Paul just couldn't really take over and he had all those turnovers, uh, 15 turnovers. He had six in game two against the Bucks, and they still win it. That's a little kind of red flag right there. Four turnovers in game number three, and they lose by 20, and five turnovers, and they lose by six. So we need Chris Paul just to clean it up a little bit more out there. Um, and then Cameron Johnson, we just need him to be real solid. Let's see um, what they do with their second big. Let's see how many minutes Frank Kaminsky plays because he's been playing real lackluster minutes. I don't even think he really played in game number four. Let's uh, check this one out. Uh, it was really just kind of uh, DeAndre Ayton getting most of the play out there. Um, yeah, I mean, Frank Kaminsky didn't even play. It was just they just put Torrey Craig out there, which is still a solid option. Um, but I think he lacks a little height. How tall is Torrey Craig? I want to say like 6'8". Yeah, even worse, like 6'7". So it's like, mm, you know, what are we really doing out there? Let's see. 
what they do here for their beefs a little bit more. Let's see if they put Frank Kaminsky out there. I would like to see him out there a little bit more. Um, we do like his kind of, you know, down low presence. He can't hit the three, which is unfortunate. Uh, but you still need a little bit more size, especially when you're trying to go against, you know, Giannis out there. All right, now the Bucks. What has the Bucks been doing? Well, they're only good at home. Giannis can play anywhere on the road at home. It doesn't matter. But Chris Middleton is just way better uh, at home. He's way more confident shooting. He's way more better just scoring the ball. I think he averages like 25 points at home and about like 19 points at on the road, um, which is, you know, you know, you need to come whenever. You need to come every game, big game, on the road, at home. It shouldn't matter. So Chris Middleton is going to have a real – he's going to be under the microscope for this game. I mean, we've been following and kind of critiquing the narrative all the time of him being the Batman here. Yes, he was kind of solid in game four, but we also saw the good with the bad. I mean, we saw him kind of miss a lot of kind of – clinching shots we saw him miss the final the 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 two th uh shots right back to back he misses a mid-range jumper they get the offensive rebound he misses another one and that's what that was with uh, like 40 seconds left in the game and Giannis having to kind of bail him out defensively forcing the turnover on Chris Paul so Chris Middleton had some good shots, but he also had some bad. That's what we always say. He's inconsistently consistent, folks. Um, you know, he never shoots anything great. It's always kind of like mid-40% shooting, which is, once again, just mediocre. It's nothing great. It's nothing bad. It's just it's just all right out there. And that's what Chris Middleton is. And that's not going to be enough to get it done on the road. Brooke Lopez hasn't really been playing that many minutes. Drew Holiday has been really solid here. I think he struggled here. Did he struggle in game four? What happened with uh, uh, Drew Holiday? 13 points on 20% shooting. So Drew Holiday had a real bad game number four at home. It was really just truly Chris Middleton with his 40 points really helping out this Bucks team a lot. So Drew Holiday is going to have to step it up here on the road. Chris Middleton is going to have to step it up. Giannis, I mean, this man will always get his. I mean, there is nobody that can stop him. And as the series progresses, they're going to kind of drop off a little hard, um, down low anyway. So Giannis is still going to get his, and you know him just kind of being that big, beefy presence, always going down low, always being in the paint. It wears down the Suns' bigs most of the time. And I kind of want to quickly bring up um, the Bucks here. Because they just had to face the Hawks, and the Hawks are kind of the same kind of similar team than what this Suns team is. You got a solid big down low, DeAndre Ayton, Clint Capella. You've got a real kind of solid point guard and a scoring guard as well. You know, and Trey Young can really do it all. He's kind of a Chris Paul and a Devin Booker all mixed in one. So kind of a, a similar team where they're kind of more of an outside shooting team than they are kind of an interior down low game. So I want to just bring up this Bucks series against the Hawks because it kind of kind of went the same way. Not really, but it kind of. Uh, so they lose game one on the road, but it's 2-2 going back to Atlanta. And that's kind of the similarity, that, well, the only similarity that there is here in the Suns and Hawks series is that they're 2-2 going on the road. And what do they do? They kind of had a great game and they won by nine points. Absolutely fantastic. Let's have a, uh, let's look at the box score here and see what the box did. All right, so Chris Middleton, 26 points on 50% shooting. That's exactly what we need. 26 points and 13 rebounds and 8 assists. That's a magnificent game by Chris Middleton. That's exactly what we need right here from him tonight for them to win. Drew Holiday had 25 points and 13 assists. Once again, an absolutely spectacular game. Once again, as the series progresses uh, for the Hawks, they get worn down a little bit. They can't live and die by the three. And that's what the Suns are kind of going on as well. The the outside shooting, the, the the down low game, it was perfect in games one and two. But in games three and four, when they're on the road, it, they just couldn't rely on that outside scoring anymore. Just nobody else besides Devin Booker can get it done. And that's where the Bucks thrive as the season progresses. They're always there. They're always ready. There's nothing nothing spectacular about this Bucks team, but they're always ready to play at their highest level on any given night where the Suns, they had all that momentum and they slowly been losing it. The Bucks always start with like no momentum momentum or less momentum and always just stick around and they're used to kind of being in this kind of pressure filled situation of you know losing game one even losing games one and two 
and then kind of having their backs be against the wall the entire time, where the Suns haven't really had that adversity this entire season. This entire postseason, anyway. So the Bucks are just always there, always decently consistent. It's whether you know Chris Middleton steps up or not, and they both stepped up in Game Five on the road against the Hawks when the series was tied two-two. And uh, there was no, um, there was no Giannis that game. So we know he had a little bit of an injury, and he he didn't play that game, and they were still able to win on the road. So that's a huge, great sign for this Bucks team. Now, let's bring about the jersey curse. We wore the jersey game one and two. Suns win it. Our Chris Paul Clippers CP3 jersey. And we didn't wear it for games three and four. And they lose the game. Now, uh, y'all told us, told us we had a uh, we had a poll going. Um, here it is. Uh, six votes. It won uh, five to one. <laughs> five to one. Wear the jersey. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So we have the kind of uh, curse on our side that the Suns are going to win. But overall, the Bucks they're always there. It doesn't seem like they ever get fatigued. The Suns team was just kind of running on their outside shooting. They can't have that great outside shooting anymore. And that down low game is just non-existent anymore. It's just DeAndre Ayton cannot work his way down low anymore. It's unfortunate. Uh, the Bucks cleaned it up. They let Clint Capella and uh, Trey Young kill him in the pick and roll game, game one. And they never... Never let it happen again. Kind of same thing with the Suns. The Chris Paul, he was able to get anything he wanted. DeAndre Ayton had a great game. Uh, they were switching on everything, so Chris Paul was just picking them apart. And then they shut it down and never kind of really looked back um, after that after that game one. So I'm going to take the Bucks here with the three and a half on the road. I'm believing in Chris Middleton. I believe he will have a real solid game. I believe Drew Holiday is going to have a real solid game. I'm talking 20 plus points for the both of them on real solid shooting, 46 and 46 percent shooting and above. And then Giannis will do classic Giannis, Giannis things, and that's going to get the dub. And I'm also kind of predicting that Chris Paul just doesn't have that great shooting game, and the offense is a little stagnant. Yes, Devin Booker can go for 40, but still, you have to rely on Jay Crowder. And McCall Bridges, who kind of never shoots a lot. And DeAndre Ayton, who's getting locked up. And Chris Paul, who has shown uh, spurts of not being able to shoot the ball well. And you're going to have to rely on those other four to kind of get it done in the scoring game. I do want to see... Cameron Payne get a lot of minutes. But um, his overall lack of production in game number four. Um, just kind of statistical production. Cameron Payne, uh, he was a plus zero on the floor. So hopefully that is a sign that Monty Williams will play him more. I want to see this man play 25 minutes. He speeds up the offense better than Chris Paul does. And uh, if they do that, the Suns can win it. But I'm expecting Chris Paul to kind of you know put himself out there a lot. Not wanting to get taken out. Want wants this to have to kind of be his game maybe kind of overdoes it a little bit and I think the Bucks just calm cool collected they never panic they never kind of celebrate too high they never get too low on themselves in losses and I think the Bucks are just kind of emotionally consistent folks they're emotionally consistent where the Suns team they were at the highest of highs winning two two games in a row uh two oh final lead I mean that's fantastic and now they're at the lowest of the lows now tied 2-2 going back to Phoenix in a must win game because it's back on the road for game six if they lose it so I'm going with the Bucks here folks emotionally consistent Bucks team they don't waver they never fare uh badly they will get it done here and we'll take the three and a half as a little bit of a safety blanket so Bucks plus three and a half is our official predict for tonight's game Alrighty, folks, that is going to do it for us today. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Let's uh, see if there's anything breaking as we were live, live, live. It does not appear so. It does not appear so. Alrighty, folks. Well, that's gonna do it for us tonight. Tonight, today, <laughs> freaking watch, uh, watch game five tonight, folks. NBA Finals. Get it done. Alrighty.